I'm hoping to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking to you about something called FMD, which you all come to clinic to ask me about. Um, and just to kind of educate ourselves about what fibromuscular dysplasia is uh, and what do we know about it and its association with SCAD. So ideally in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna take you through what is actual FMD, FMD and its risk factors, what is the research and the current data we hold the FMD and SCAD, which is, I guess, very important to most of you sitting here. Something about the FMD and the SCAD clinic that I'm hoping to grow in London uh, and the management of this condition. Right, so what is FMD? So FMD in the literature is described as a group, it's a, it's a condition, which is basically a group of conditions that affects, uh, that affects the arteries of the body and it could effect, essentially affect any artery. But it's a non-atherosclerotic, and what I mean by that is not as a result of high cholesterol or cardiovascular disease as such, and it's a non-inflammatory or vasculitic condition that tends to mainly affect small and medium-sized vessels. And most commonly, you probably would know this, that it mainly affects the renal and carotid arteries, but essentially it could affect any territory. And this is just a diagram to just to show you. How, um, I don't know if I've got a pointer, but um, hopefully I can point out to what I'm, uh, what I, if you can see actually on the arrows there, that FMD can look very different in different territories and different arteries. And it also depends on the type of FMD. So here we have in panel A, which is the kind of the typical, I would say, beading appearance, but a bit more different to panel B. Uh, in panel C, you've got a focal stenosis, so a narrowing within the artery. Uh, and then in, similarly in panel D, and this is because there are different types of FMD that now we're aware of. So how common is this is FMD? Um, so there's been lots of registries and lots of data, but it, it, it suggests that the prevalence of symptomatic renal FMD, so these are patients who've had symptoms as a result of it, mainly high blood pressure, is around the region of four out of a thousand. And prevalence of cervical cranial FMD, so this is FMD that affects the arteries here off the neck heading to the brain, is about half of that. And this is in people who've presented with symptoms, for example, stroke at young age or um, headaches uh, or things like that. <coughs> So this is in people who are symptomatic, and clearly there is a huge volume of patients who will be asymptomatic as a result of this. It does mainly affect the renal um, and the uh, cervicocephalic arteries, but as I said, it can also affect any area. Um, in 30% of the patients, it does tend to affect more than one area. So people who have FMD in the renal arteries may have FMD in the iliac arteries, so these are the arteries going down through the leg, or in the neck, and it can present at any age. And what I mean by that is that there is documentation of case reports and small registries that document FMD in children, uh, in, in young women and young men, um, and also in much elderly. So it's difficult to ascertain whether the FMD uh, infancy is the same as the ones in elderly, but certainly it's been described at different ages, and people presenting with this at different ages. So what are the risk factors of the generic FMD? So there's a lot of speculations that hormones can play part, and this tends to be female hormones, such as the estrogen, that seems to play a part. It's not quite well established how, but we know that we see FMD more commonly in women. And also, FMD used to be one of those con conditions historically that when you see a young woman in clinic who comes in with high blood pressure in her 30s or 20s, the first thing you think about is, has she got fibromuscular dysplasia of the renal arteries? And that's where the screening was done. And hence where the theory about hormones comes in. There is some theory to suggest that mechanical stress, and by what I mean by that is recurrent trauma uh, or mechanical stress, can also cause FMD in the iliac arteries. And that's been partly because there's been a lot of um, kind of screening in people who do cycling uh, or those kind of sports, and therefore fibromuscular dysplasia have been found in the iliac vessels of these patients who are hypertensive. So remember, all of these patients present with hypertension before the, the screening. So hence where that, that is thought to be a possible plausible cause. Smoking, though we know FMD is a non-atherosclerotic condition, so it's not associated with your conventional cardiovascular risk factors, but there is some suggestion that smoking can probably worsen this. 
Obviously, there is some genetic susceptibility to this condition, and I won't go very far into this because I know Dave is talking about the genetics of SCAD later, which <coughs> coincides with the genetics of FMD. But certainly, there is um, a familial history of FMD. Uh, in about 10% of patients who have hypertension, there, is, there will be a first-degree relative who may also have a very similar condition. Excuse me, sorry, that's my phone. Sorry, I should have switched it off. Um, so th th those are the potential risk factors that we think about when we see patients in FMD. So how about the asymptomatic ones? Well, so data from the kidney donor registries actually suggested the prevalence of FMD is a lot higher and actually is underestimated. So these are in, in cases where patients were not known to be hypertensive. The mean age of diagnosis tends to be around the age of 50 in patients who are diagnosed, and it tends to, again, affect mainly the young and the middle-aged women, but can also be diagnosed in men, and as we said, in all kind of ages from infancy to elderly. It tends to be a systemat systemic disease, so it's unlikely just to be in one area. So as you know, when I screen uh, patients when we see in clinic, we look at all the territories to ensure that this doesn't affect more than one territory. And what is unknown is whether if we pick it up in one territory, whether later on in life, it's likely to present in a different area. And I think that's, that's something we're not aware of at the moment. As you all know, it's something that is associated with spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And as I mentioned, there is a hereditary component uh, in association with this. So I guess these are the takeaway messages from the couple of slides that I've just mentioned. So... As I mentioned, there's also different types of FMD, and the different types of FMD is what results in the different features of FMD that we see. So the, F the different types is dependent on the layer. As you recall, uh, a vessel has three layers, the intima, which is the inner layer, the media, which is the middle layer, and then the adventitia, which is the outer layer. The most commonest uh, type is the medial fibroplasia, so that's where we get this beading type of appearance, and that affects probably 85% of the FMD cases. The intimal one is less common, and it tends to be more associated with that kink and small narrowing, which I showed you the earlier picture of um, uh, in, in arteries, and it tends to be slightly less likely to be a renal and more likely to be other territories. Um, and also, there is different, um, so it could also present as multifocal, which basically means the beads of appearance, so lots of beads along a vessel, greater than a one centimeter, or it could just be a tubular single stenosis. And that's important histologically as to what type it is, but in terms of its management, probably there isn't very much difference. So again, the symptoms and signs of FMD really depends on where the, the location of um, where it, it does affect. So the commonest symptoms, as we mentioned, I guess something we, we look for very closely is, the hype, is has the patient got hypertension or have they been diagnosed with hypertension that remains to be untreated? Um, other things can include that patients could present with pain as a result of aneurysm affecting the renal artery or it could be that they've had a dissection in the renal artery which affects the nerves around the area and that could also present with pain. So these are the symptoms we look out for. Other symptoms we look out for are people who've got persistent headaches, uh, worsening migraines. Um, this phenomenon of pulsatile ringing and swishing noises in the ear, which makes me th always kind of think about we should really look for this um, FMD very closely. Um, dizziness and neck pain sometimes can be associated, in particularly if there is an aneurysm that's compressing a nerve or a local structure. And obviously patients can also present with small bleeds uh, in the head or can present with uh, a stroke-like uh, presentation because uh, of a dissection in any of the vessels that run up to the brain. Other sites could cause similar symptoms like abdominal pain, that's if the vessel that's affected is the one that go goes to the bowel. And as a result of it, some patients may not be able to eat and have some weight loss. There is this phenom phenomenon of some patients do complain of leg pain, particularly on walking or doing something exertional. Uh, in, if they've got significant FMD and stenosis, so narrowing in the arteries that go down to the legs. Um, and obviously the spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is an association with this condition. But the main, main uh, complications that we tend to be uh, focused on are the hypertension, the aneurysms, and the dissections, which um, we talk about when we see you in clinic. Uh, 
So how do we diagnose it? So there's different forms of modalities of uh, looking at this. Um, as you know, most of you have had some sort of imaging with MRI or CT. I think the standard remains to be those two. Um, I personally feel CT gives you a lot more information if we can limit the dose of radiation uh, because it takes much more, uh, the slices are much more thinner and it enables us to assess if there is, within the FMD if there is also a dissection. However, we also can use other forms of imaging such as ultrasound. So if we know that there is an area of FMD, for example, in the neck or in the renal arteries, we can use ultrasound to look at the velocity, the flow to that organ, uh, to see how the velocities have changed and whether there is a compromise in blood flow to those organs, which is very important in terms of the management of patients. And prehistorically, and in some centres, they still do catheter angiography, so this is a much more invasive form of looking at FMD, uh, just like you have an angiogram where they put a catheter up and inject a dye into that vessel, and obviously it gives you a direct visualisation of that artery, so hence um, you would get a better probable diagnosis, but it doesn't come, out, come without risks. So what, are, what is the main treatment of uh, the generic FMD? So mainly it tends to be surveillance. Uh, and the reason is, is because where there is been reports about patient, people interfering in these in terms of stenting them or trying to do surgery, there always has led to complications or there is always a higher degree of complications as opposed to the atherosclerotic narrowing of a vessel. So that's caused by the high cholesterol and kind of the fairing up of the artery. So we tend to kind of stay on the side of surveillance unless there is reduced flow to that organ in particular or there is a result kind of complication of the FMD causing <coughs> dissection which then could cause other problems for that patient. And the mainstay really is around treating high blood pressure because if the patient did have high blood pressure and FMD there are risks of developing complications like aneurysms and developing complications like dissections would be a lot higher. So we tend to aim for a lower <coughs> blood pressure in these patients in order to um, reduce the risks of further complication. Right, how about the most important topic? Spontaneous coronary artery dissection and FMD. So um, I guess my, my experience in FMD had previously always been the young woman who comes into clinic with high blood pressure, but that's clearly changed since I've got interested in SCAD. So we know that there is a strong association and in de various registries and depends on which one you read and which one you follow, the prevalence can vary anything from about 50% to over 80%. Um, and I think that probably sits at a decent ball mark of what we actually see. Commonly, we tend to see more than one area affected. So I think most of you will know that if you've got FMD in your renal arteries, we tend to pick up something else somewhere else in about 50% of the cases. Um, I'll skip that and I'll come back to it in a second. Um, so what, what do we do um, with, F, with SCAD and FMD? So most of the time, there, so there has been registries to suggest that if you've had spontaneous coronary artery dissection, then ideally you should be screened. And we look particularly for FMD in all your vessels extending from the head all the way to the femoral arteries, partly because we're likely to find it in those cases. And I think this is now being supported by a European consensus to say, that is part of the guidelines of how we should manage spontaneous coronary artery dissection and FMD. And I'll come back to, I think, probably more in the answer and question session about how we treat this and depends on what we find in every patient. But I'm just going to skip a slide back about, um, and I think, sorry, I put this in the wrong order, about the genetics of FMD because that's partly important for when it comes to SCAD and FMD. So there's been a lot of, and I think that's a big question for most of you, is that if I find FMD, am I going to find it in my children? What happens to me? How do you treat me? So there is, there is reported cases about probably 10% of patients will have some sort of a genetic predisposition. And that's partly because we find this in families. However, most of it tends, tends to be a genetic variation. So not a specific trait has been found or a gene that could be attributed to this. And actually, the European registry of FMD um, kind of suggests that we do exactly the same as SCAD in most patients, is that in case of hypertension, we screen the patient for all, for all vessels. And if there is any suggestion of symptoms, then that should be treated. So that goes back to exactly how we should treat FMD with SCAD as well, as there isn't a huge amount of literature, is that it's really based on the symptoms of the patient. So in most cases, what we find is that patients, we're incidentally finding 
that they have got fibromuscular dysplasia. In most cases, patients are not hypertensive, so they don't have a history of blood pressure. Um, and therefore, surveillance is probably more important in those cases and screening to understand the progression of this disease. Very quickly, um, just to let you know about what, we've st what I've started with my colleagues in London in terms of the SCAD and FMD clinic. So we kind of see anything between two to four cases. Yesterday was eight. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't leave till nine o'clock last night. Um, with, uh, with patients who've been recently diagnosed with SCAD, and what, what we tend to do is, um, for those of you who've come, and I hope we've managed to give you a good service, is organise imaging on the same day um, to look for whether there is fibromuscular dysplasia, but not only fibromuscular dysplasia, is to see if there is any evidence of other vascular abnormalities that may be associated with SCAD. Also, some of you, you may have had the pleasure of having a monitor put on you on the same day, and I do tend to do this in patients where I think they may have an underlying blood pressure that's been misdiagnosed, or I find that there is severe fibromuscular dysplasia in the renal arteries is just to give me an understanding of what the blood pressure fluctuation is. We obviously organise blood to look at your renal function um, and other parameters as well. Um, and most patients tend to be seen later on in the afternoon in clinic for us to discuss their results and kind of tell them this is what we find. And the next step would be to kind of discuss it in a bit of a larger forum in something that I've kind of jumped into called the aortic MDT. So this pre-existed my date, but essentially the, the, we have an aortic MDT where various specialities would sit down together and discuss usually the atherosclerotic dissections or aneurysms and to make a decision. So I've kind of adopted these people into the same session, which are the vascular doctors, our radiologists, our neurologists and myself to discuss every case and almost kind of 90% of the cases unless there is nothing significant go through this MDT forum to decide how we should best manage them. So for example if we need to do further Dopplers or the surgeons believe that actually the patient needs to be seen earlier because they think there is more progression. So that it gives us an, a way to be able to manage this um, in a multidisciplinary way than just me because there isn't a huge amount of information still out there in terms of how do we manage FMD with SCAD and we're kind of adopting the FMD registry management plan rather than SCAD and FMD by itself.